Welcome to Care Talk, America's home for incisive debate about healthcare business and policy. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrics, your co-host at Health 2021. David, who do we have wrapping up the day today? Well, we have Blythe Adamson, and she has... The famous Blythe Adamson. Okay, let's not... No, no pressure, but... Uh, you You're know, not but, famous. But pressure. Uh, so she is the director of quantitative sciences at Flatiron Health, and also founder and epidemiologist at Infectious Economics. And she just said it's safe to talk into the microphone, but if it starts blowing stuff back at you, it's less safe. (laughs) Blythe, welcome. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about what got you interested in epidemiology, which has obviously exploded during COVID, interest in how data works and who gets sick and why, but how did you get involved in epidemiology? Uh, Well, I first got involved because of my family. Uh, When I was in elementary school, a family member became infected with HIV, and this was a time before there were drugs, uh, and it was such a painful time that as a child I thought, you know, I love science and math, and how can I use those skills to prevent other families from feeling the type of grief that that my family was going through at the time. And so, you know, I I just became involved in, in the HIV community, and uh, ended up getting a job in a lab and doing PCR and sequencing. Uh, How of, old were you at that point? Oh, my first job in a lab was at 18. So that's how long I've been doing PCR. And you were working with Dr. Fauci at that point? So it was uh, a few years into that that I transitioned into uh, a role at the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. And that's the when I first uh, met Fauci. And he has an incredible passion for the development of HIV vaccines. And I spent more than a decade uh, working on those clinical trials, building a lot of math models to understand once a vaccine becomes available, how are we going to price this? How are we going to roll it out? What is the implementation going to look like to you know, have the most efficiency in creating public good and gaining health as quickly as possible? And that's, I think, a lot of what helped prepare me to be ready when COVID hit. Well, we didn't get a vaccine for HIV just yet that works, but COVID happened a lot faster, some would say, at warp speed. And what are some of the um, epidemiological issues related to the vaccine and how it's being deployed? Well, right now, I think one of the the biggest communication difficulties and nuances with understanding how the vaccine works to protect us is really tied up in, does it block us from getting infected? And the answer really is no. It offers some reduced risk of becoming infected right after you get your first couple shots, but after that it really declines over time. And the vaccines really do work in protecting our health, protecting us from becoming hospitalized and dying, but you know, we really still have to modify behaviors, modify our environments that we're in uh, so that we can continue to keep our health system strong and keep people healthy. You know what, you just... just, Let's just just roll back the table a bit. So, Blythe, weren't you involved in the White House's evaluation of kind of COVID when it it hit? How How did you get to the White House? Well, I, you know, as someone who's spent my entire life trying to prepare in learning the epidemiology aspects of it and the economics, you know, I was so grateful for the opportunity to volunteer. So I took a formal leave of absence from, from my role at Flatiron Health and uh, went and served on, the, was first called to FEMA uh, and then invited to serve on the White House COVID Task Force on Healthcare Resilience. And so it was, remained a, as the, the lead data scientist uh, in the West Wing at the what, White House. What was the biggest challenge initially in the early days of COVID? As, I mean, it just felt like we were all flat-footed in a lot of ways, but what were you, just as a practical public health matter, we're not a, we're not as a system organized for public health. You're, 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 you're in the White House, you're at FEMA, uh, the Emergency Management Association, that, that sort of trying to, everyone was trying to figure out what we had, like what, what, what did it feel like and what were the big gaps and lessons learned? You know, now that we're, you know, well away from that. Well, I think one of the greatest assets that experts brought when they came to volunteer and all converged on FEMA and the White House, and we had, you know, experts from CDC and HHS, you know, and economists from, you know, the Council of Economic Advisors, when everyone came together, a lot of what they were using was gut intuition from other diseases, trying to blend what we knew from influenza and HIV. But one of the parameters I remember having the greatest uncertainty about was how many people are 
infected with this virus right now and transmitting it to other people, but don't experience any symptoms at all. And to me, that was one of the biggest mysteries because we didn't really have testing, enough testing to be able to test the entire country and have a good handle on where this was. And if 20% of people are asymptomatic or 80% of, of people are asymptomatic, that dramatically changes what your public health policy should be to mitigate the spread. And what was it like working in the, in, in the Trump White House? I mean, it's not just the Trump White House, it's the White House in wartime. I mean, it's, it's and did you really start to talk about a bedroom story? With the president, what, what, I read John, that, this not a, anecdote. Not a bedroom story, bedtime story. Bedtime story. <laughs> you're getting you're getting your stories confused. Well, that John. was Jonathan Bush's. This, this is the, the Jonathan Bush interview. That's it. That's your other podcast, John. No, not that, this was, one. that was that yeah. was no Jonathan Bush. Well, I thought it's a good. But, but is that is that did did you really ask the talk to the president about a bedtime story? So I did land up uh, end up in the Oval Office many times, and one of the challenges I think in being a scientist and uh, is communication you know, to, to people that are non-scientists. And one of his first questions to me was, you know, where do I think this virus came from? And so I told him a story that I've told to my own children hundreds of times, which was just, it's, we call it the jungle story. And it, uh, I just really talk about, just, just set the scene of what happened uh, in the jungle in Africa when, you know, when humans were interacting with monkeys and, and there was this spillover of virus and how common and plausible it is that, that spillovers happen all the time. Uh, and so he, did, he found it to be engaging. And you know, I think a lot of what my role was in the White House, well, aside from coding you know, 20 hours a day, uh, would be just being brought into meetings and help, help be the translator. You know, on one side of the table, you've got all the health experts. On the other side of the table, you have all the economists. And being trained in both, you know, I mean, they use different words to describe the same things. And so I, would, I was often just the translator uh, between these two disciplines and also the translator to, you know, to White House staff who weren't familiar with these scientific concepts. So what was your role in bringing back big-time sports? Oh, well, it was... Uh, uh, it was, I, I served as an advisor for uh, many of the different major sports leagues, and a lot of the role was in designing their testing programs. Uh, and so in this, uh, it's pretty easy to build math models even to figure out how often do you have to be testing people to have enough confidence that every time they're out there with their masks off, doing their jobs, that, that they are safe and that you're confident in their negative COVID status. Uh, and so it was through that that I first was also brought into the NBA's investment into Yale and the development of the saliva direct test. But I, I think one of the things that I, I just going back to what I hope we'll never repeat again is there is a huge lack of data. I think you're 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 you have the advantage of actually understanding probability and statistics, which is just not a traditional background for anyone in government and politics, and yet is essential given the scale of the decisions. But initially, it just didn't even feel like we had decent data coming out of the hospitals. All of these hospitals, and whether it's a Cerner point of view or an Epic point of view or eClinical Works, that it's not actually easy to even get the data for the models. How did you handle that? And is that still a problem? Well, I would say that this has definitely revealed vulnerabilities within our public health data infrastructure. And there are other countries that really came out of this winning. I mean, looking at the UK and some of the, the studies that they were able to put out really quickly using electronic medical records from their entire population, that's astounding. And we did not have those same capabilities within the United States. But what gives me hope is that before, in the before times, it was always really difficult to make a compelling argument why investment was needed to create to modernize the data that CDC had access to. You know, now we can see for national security reasons and for you know to uh, for economic security reasons, we need to have this type of data infrastructure in place so that you know we don't have so we don't have the same types of threats. And economists get it now. So on the one hand, you know, we didn't have a lot of data. People were working on intuition about other diseases before for making all sorts of public health recommendations. Now there's more data and conclusions have been drawn, but I wonder how much of that changes 
when you have the delta variant. So for example, things that we thought you know, they learned from the data and are applying it, well now it no longer applies, or, or maybe it does. How do you think about that? Because it certainly confuses people when they hear about, well gee, I thought this, what about the six feet of distance? And what about, you know, I can't give it to somebody if I'm, you know, for whatever, whatever, whatever it may be. When we have delta, do we have to discard what we learned before, or how do we, how do we deal with that? I think the distancing has been really confusing for people and with contact tracing, you know, who, who are you actually around? Whereas I've seen real transmissions happen with, you know, people who are in recording studios, you know, a, a sound booth where someone... Not this one. Not, not the, well, I noticed right away, I love that you have no top. Yeah, I know we couldn't afford it. John, <laughs> actually, John blew the top in the first guest. <laughs> it was a good, it was a good yeah. interview. Well, really, I've seen transmissions where, you know, someone's in a sound booth or in a tiny conference room for talking on the phone for a half an hour and they leave a thick, potent COVID, you know, aerosolized cloud of virus. And then hours later, another person comes in by themselves and, you know, breathes it in. And with Delta, you know, you just get it in a snap. So uh, it's confusing to people because that breaks the rules of contacts. You can you know, catch it from just walking through the air that someone has left in a room. So I like to explain it. <laughs> but, I I do, first but, I, but I do want to underscore the point that you made that in terms of per, you know, d your protection against serious hospitalization, illness, and death, the vaccines are actually pretty potent across all of the variants we've seen, and they're very resilient. Even the booster stuff, I think, is... Rel less impressive than what we're seeing in the long term. I mean, are you, are you at least uh, on the data I've seen, Blythe, that's still true. It's pretty remarkable. It is. It's really incredible. And I'm hoping that, I mean, mRNA vaccines are amazing. And they were designed for the purpose of being able to adapt really quickly. Yeah. So I'm really excited for how quickly we will have capabilities of updating these mRNA vaccines so that they can con continue to closely match whatever the circulating strain is. Based on what you've seen with the mRNA vaccine and given how quickly we were able to set it up, forgetting the manufacturing capacity, because warp speed was a one-time investment, wouldn't the, the design of this allow for a sort of a designer drug against the common cold and flu? Against regular corona coronaviruses and, and flu? I'm hoping that we can make mRNA vaccines that are going to be protective of many different circulating viruses. So, in, and especially when we think about with children right now, we're often seeing co-infections with uh, RSV and COVID at the, sa at the same time. So I think that and there's- And RSV is a really serious thing if your kid gets that respiratory virus. It's, 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 it's it, you know, it really puts the kids down. Um, so maybe maybe we could switch a little bit, Bly, then you could talk a little bit about what, what your current, you currently wear two hats, one around sort of infectious economics, uh, which is about pre currently preventing infection of COVID and advising on that. And the other is your job at Flatiron Health, which was really a remarkable company that was kind of adding intelligence to the current uh, community-based oncology practices what is Flatiron doing now? And did the big experiment of all of that money from Roche and others and in venture capitalists really work to drive insights in terms of cancer care? Flatiron still has the most beautiful real world data that I've ever seen in my life. And to me, it-, it David thinks data is beautiful too. <laughs> Well, I'm, I, it was enough that I moved my family across the country just to get access to their data. I mean, it, they were the first in the world to really unlock unstructured components of medical records. So being able to, you know, go through the text of a phys physician's note, being able to look at the actual images and PDF scans and handwritten notes on forms, you know, all of those things were trapped within the electronic medical record. And so for me, it's been so freeing to be able to use natural language processing and machine learning, you know, and actually understand so much more depth than we ever understood before and use it for really powerful things like to compare the effectiveness of two different treatments or evaluate a policy like Medicaid expansion. So from that, I mean, there's a lot of people around here who talk ML, uh, AI, that's a lot more artificial than intelligent. <laughs> from, from, from your perspective, can you actually improve cancer care based on stru the structured data is like claims information where it's a standard format, unstructured information, you know, uh, doctor's notes, uh, r random things they, that are in the record. Can that actually change the way people get care and get better care in cancer? Absolutely. To me, precision medicine really is going to be getting the right drug to the right person at the right time. And I honestly, I'm not 
going to sell the, this fake idea that machine learning algorithms are going to best predict that. But we do have technical challenges right now in causal inference with observational data where we're often missing elements within data sets. And we can use machine learning to help reduce our uncertainty and you know, infer what we think some of these missing things are. And really at the end of the day, what that helps us do is to actually better compare apples to apples to different patients who are similar in every other characteristic except one received this drug and the other received this drug. So I think that it's really applying ML in the right way, but it's not like one big ML algorithm is going to solve all cure of this cancer. and yeah, yeah, cure cancer. So so it's great that you know have real world evidence and precision medicine and really be able to make these comparisons and get the right drug to the right person, but you have to have the right people and maybe everybody in the database in order to have that happen. And I know there's you know, definitely issues about inclusion of people in clinical trials that are representative, even you know, the data sets that Flatiron is working with. And the data is beautiful, but you know, how representative is it? What's Flatiron doing in order to, to improve that? Well, I do think it's really interesting when I look at clinical trials that are trying to understand the, the efficacy of a new drug and the average age of the people in the trial is 65 years old. But then across the country, maybe the average age of people who might use that drug is 78. So is it still going to perform as well in an older, sicker population than was included in the believe. trial? You know, uh, what about socioeconomic status? You know, I think that there's an incredible opportunity for real world data to have, be the platform for uh, allowing and enabling more inclusive research to be happening. And ha understanding the representativeness of every real world data set is a, is a critical part of that. So I want to go back to a, a question that I had from early on in the podcast. <laughs> um, I, anyway, our, our, our producer, yeah, finally. So, and it was what you said up front about how the vaccines don't necessarily protect against infection, but they pre prevent uh, you know, hospitalization and death. I wonder what you think about the term, you know, breakthrough infection. Is that is that the right mm -hmm. way to consider it? Well, here is one uh, benefit that I'm seeing uh, comparing the viral dynamics of a vaccinated person to an unvaccinated person. I'm really seeing the durability or the duration of infectiousness to be much shorter among vaccinated people. So an unvaccinated person, you know, they might get exposed on day zero and pop positive on day four, and they might continue to have a high viral load and be infectious and spread it to other people for three to five days. Yet what I'm seeing in vaccinated people, because their bodies have already generated this robust re immune response, they already know how to fight back, that their bodies eradicate the virus much more quickly. And so sometimes people are only infectious for 12 to 24 hours. And that is important because it changes the way, again, we want to design policies to mitigate the risk of transmission. Yeah, I mean, I think if you went from breakthrough infection to low cost illness. If you caught I me, mean, it's, it's, the, it's the Danny Kahneman point about your friend who worked with Amos Tversky around framing. I think that the framing of it, Blythe, has been dumb because if you talk about <laughs> breakthrough infection, it sounds like the house is burning down when really we never, based on vaccinations, we always would expect some 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 element of infections, but it's a question of what the what the healthcare burden is, what the pain is to the individual, whether the person can get really sick, and that's th these vaccines are incredibly durable. But I do think they're going to require, just based on virology, probably boosters. I think we we haven't always, and I think this is nonpartisan to say that the politicians have not set expectations in a way that consumers and folks who are like nervous mothers can easily consume and understand what the next stage is going to be like or how they should behave. And I. I don't know. How, I don't think we're going to solve for that, but hopefully, if, if we not get, on the podcast, well, yeah, not on this guy's. Well, maybe maybe more of the, the the politicians will 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 work with you to not just understand statistics, but understand how to talk about this stuff because this is. You may need we, another uh, bedroom story, John, for you. So. <laughs> so, so do you think that you know, given what you said about the um, what the the dynamics are of somebody that has COVID that had vaccination, did we take away the right? Conclusions from the Provincetown experience uh, over the summer. What was the province? I mean, you just you just don't, you're bringing up Cape references. What are you talking? Well, about? they didn't say they didn't actually specify Provincetown, but you know, over July fourth, there were a lot of people that uh, were infected in Provincetown, despite the fact that there was masking and people were vaccinated and so on. And I think the assumption was that vaccinated people were spreading uh, the disease to other vaccinated people and so on. But probably it was unvaccinated people that were actually involved in that and not vaccinated people. 
Well, I do see, I, as an epidemiologist doing boots on the ground outbreak investigations, I've seen super spreading events among fully vaccinated groups. So we do know it can happen. And I think it's one of the reasons why we have to think about how do we want to use testing then to, to mitigate the risk of this. You know, if you're not going to test, then it should be, you know, you should be vaccinated, well ventilated and, and wearing a mask. But if you don't want to wear a mask, then maybe everyone should be tested so that you have more confidence. So I think that there, there are ways that we and, have and to. And why hasn't testing been embraced? It just has always felt like the, the third leg of the school of therapeutics, vaccines and testing. And yet it, it's not political. It's not been funded and it's not been maintained. And we keep coming back to that as a point of failure. Why do you think that's the case? I want to know why you think it's the case. If I could answer it in one sentence, then you know we could have solved testing already. Well, David's worried. He's, he's got his I mean, CO2 I'm taking my carbon, carbon dioxide monitor. <laughs> yes. So we. Are I don't even mo- need the bullshit monitor around with you, John. It'll go. It, it'll sound. Well, you've the alarm already provided that intensely. So I think we've. Got, I think we've learned a lot. All right. Well, that's a good way to. We don't have. You don't have a more clever way to close out the podcast. Well, you're you're sitting there playing with your CO2. Well, John, I want to know, what do you think is the reason why we didn't fully embrace testing? I I, I think ultimately, like in so many cases, political leadership didn't embrace. We got lucky on, everyone embraced um, the warp speed and the investment in vaccines. And they were sold as a miracle cure. I think we got lucky a, a little bit on the therapeutics that were already in development for like diseases. But honestly, we were late and we didn't actually even communicate that. Look at the use of the monoclonal antibodies that are absolutely makes the disease recede, were provided to hospitals and they weren't even used because we didn't get that point. And then finally, I think we never communicated and set the right expectations around testing. Ultimately, in a crisis, whether you're at war with a, with a physical enemy or a virus, Leadership matters, and leadership understanding and setting the agenda and then communicating it in a way that government and people can support it is the measure of why Connecticut is the highest vaccination rate, the lowest infection rate, and brought industry, healthcare together, and why you've got other states where the leaders did not do that, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's still a mess. And I, and I think that, that uh, unfortunately, we still rely, even when you've got the best advice, uh, like yourself and Dr. Fauci, uh, on on leaders getting it right and then communicating and bringing the people with them. I think that's our biggest challenge, was our biggest challenge in testing and is still our biggest challenge in testing. Well, John, I certainly don't want to have a hard question like that. So I'm going to wrap up the episode here and say that's it for yet another edition of Care Talk here at Health 2021. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrics. If you liked what you heard or you didn't, please subscribe on your favorite service. And thank you, Bly, for joining us. Thank you for having